Okay, so last time we started talking about heat exchangers, and uh, we talked uh, for some time about different configurations that the heat exchangers can have, so parallel, counter, cross, uh, flow, all those different types of heat exchangers. Um, and we said that um, one thing that you can do regardless of the type of heat exchanger that always looks the same is an overall energy balance. So um, that's what uh, these two equations are. They're basically saying you know, no matter what type of heat exchanger you have, the rate of heat transfer is related to how much the uh, energy of the hot fluid uh, decreases, which is this top equation. And, and it, that has to be equal to how much the energy of the, of the cold fluid increases, which is this bottom equation. So there are some assumptions that go into this energy balance, like uh, incompressible flow, and uh, we're neglecting uh, pressure-driven enthalpy changes, and the, the heat capacity is constant, and things like that. Um, but there's nothing about the configuration that goes into these uh, energy equations, right? We're taking an energy balance on a control volume that just encompasses the entire heat exchanger. And the other thing we talked about is the fact that in order to figure out how good the heat exchanger is, we need to understand uh, the total thermal resistance that separates the hot and the cold streams. And that can be difficult. Um, you know, we may have to go to some kind of a compact heat exchanger correlation or something like that. But the the, the uh, goodness uh, of a heat exchanger is related to how small that resistance is. We'd like a, a good heat exchanger to have a small thermal resistance uh, or uh, equivalently a high conductance where conductance is just the inverse of the thermal resistance. So these are things that we talked about. Um, uh, if you look at these uh, equations that I have here, they are not sufficient for me to simulate a heat exchanger, right? In a typical heat exchanger situation, I will take a heat exchanger, right? I would plumb it up to a hot fluid, so I might, so I would know the inlet temperature on the hot side and, and how much flow is going through it. Uh, plumb it up to a cold fluid, I would know the inlet temperature on the cold side, and how much flow is going through it. Um, knowing the geometry, I could do some calculations to figure out the conductance. Um, that's great, but uh, that doesn't, in and of itself, allow me to calculate the performance. I can't figure out what QDOT is or the outlet temperatures, right? There's just not enough information here to do that. So in order to do that, you actually have to now dive into the heat exchanger itself and do energy balances on both of the fluids. Right? So that's what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to do it for just one of the many configurations. We're going to do it for a counterflow heat exchanger. Right, so uh, that's what I've drawn here is the counterflow heat exchanger. Um, you know, we have a hot fluid that's coming in over here on the left side and traveling from left to right. We have a cold fluid that's coming over here on the right side and traveling from right to left. And you know, we talked about how in reality this is probably happening with many, many parallel channels that are interacting with each other. But you know, in, in, in concept, at least, this is what's going on. So if I want to... Um, solve this heat exchanger, what I have to do is uh, an energy balance on the hot fluid. And I don't mean an energy balance around the entire hot fluid. I mean a, an energy balance on a differential control volume that tells me then how the, the hot fluid temperature is evolving with position as it flows through the heat exchanger. And then the same thing on the cold fluid. So the kind of uh, control volumes I need are differential. And they're differential uh, in the direction that the fluid temperature is changing, right? So one of the reasons why we selected this counterflow case, which is a relatively simple case, is because the fluid temperature is only changing in X, right? It's not a cross-flow situation where I would need uh, a differential control volume that would be differential in X and Y. In this case, only differential in X. So I'm going to do a control volume on the hot fluid and then another control volume in the cold fluid these control volumes are going to be thermally linked together because whatever energy leaves the hot fluid as heat transfer has to go to the cold fluid. All right, so let's start with the uh, hot fluid. So here's my control volume. Here I'm just making it a little bit bigger over here to the right. Um, if you think about how energy can cross the control volume, it's the typical thing, N equals out plus stored. Um, we're not doing a transient analysis, so it's just uh, N equals out. So my flow is going from uh, left to right. So I have uh, energy transfer uh, due to the enthalpy going in over here on the left side, right? So that's m dot times i, where again, i is equal to the enthalpy. 
I have some enthalpy leaving over here on the right side, so it's the same quantity, but now I add x plus dx, which I've already expanded and taken to the limit. <coughs> and then I have uh, heat transfer leaving this control volume and entering this other control volume, which we'll come back to, and that's dq dot. So in is this uh, term here, and then out are these two terms here. And if we um, just put them into the right spot in a control volume, in an energy balance, this is what we get right here. So we will cross out the, uh, the terms at x, which we normally do, and that leaves us with these two terms here. And basically it's just saying that, yeah, the, the, the enthalpy is changing, and the reason it's changing is due to the heat transfer rate. Um, we're going to simplify the enthalpy change, uh, and we do that... Um, as shown here. So uh, the rate of enthalpy change with respect to x is uh, driven by both temperature changes and by pressure changes, right? So di dx is uh, di dt at constant pressure times dt dx, and then also di dp at constant temperature times dp dx. So we're going to do uh, something that we typically do here, which is we're going to say the second term here this pressure-driven change in enthalpy is negligibly small. So we'll just get rid of it. And we can do that for one of two reasons. One reason is because di dp at constant t is usually pretty small. Um, it's usually related to the specific volume of the fluid. Uh, or perhaps because dp dx is pretty small. But for whatever reason, this term here is uh, smaller than this term here. At least that's our assumption. Um, so we're only left with this temperature-driven change in enthalpy. And of course, di dt at constant p, that is the um, specific heat capacity. All right, so the last uh, uh, assumption that we'll make, we haven't made it yet, but we will make is that the specific heat capacity is constant, it's not changing the temperature. So that gives us this equation here. <clears throat> if I take this equation and plug it into here, I get this equation. And the last thing we'll do is say that uh, m dot times c, that's our capacitance rate, right? So that's big C dot. So this is what I get then when I do an energy balance on the hot fluid. It's saying that uh, the temperature change is related to the rate of heat transfer and how big that temperature change is, is related to what's the capacitance rate. Okay, so I do the same thing on the cold fluid. So here's my energy balance on the hot fluid. I have to come up here and do the same thing on the cold fluid. That's what's shown here. Um, being a little careful of the sign because the cold fluid is flowing in the negative x direction, right? So here I have entering at location x plus dx uh, this term, this enthalpy term. Leaving at location x, I have this enthalpy term, and entering is dq dot. So that's what I get here. We go through the same steps, and I end up with this differential equation here. <clears throat> so two differential equations, right? I have... Uh, dq dot uh, is related to the temperature change of the hot fluid. The same dq dot is related to the temperature change of the cold fluid. Uh, what's left for me to do is recognize that this dq dot is actually driven by th minus tc. Right? It's driven by the local temperature difference uh, between the hot and the cold fluid. Right? So dq dot is th minus tc, and the resistance that, that separates th and tc is related to that total resistance in the heat exchanger, right? It's not equal to it because I'm not including the entire heat exchanger inside of my control volume, but it's certainly related to it. <coughs> so the resistance inside of this little differential control volume separating TH and TC is actually, if you think about it, not smaller but bigger than the resistance of the whole heat exchanger, right? I'm, I'm going to get a, a bigger resistance when I include a smaller amount of area. So this denominator here is r total and then I have to multiply it by L over dx right it's bigger than r total because um, I, I have a smaller area if this dx were equal to L in other words if this differential control volume was um, including the entire heat exchanger it wasn't differential anymore then I'd get r total but as long as dx is smaller than L I'm getting a, a resistance here that's larger than r total okay so Remembering that the inverse of our total is conductance, so uh, 1 over our total is conductance. I can write this in terms of conductance. It's TH minus TC uh, times UA, and then I'm just going to bring the DX to the top, so DX over L. 
So this is my DQ dot, right? It, I can plug that up into here and up into here in order to get uh, ordinary differential equations for temperature. Right, so here's my ordinary differential equation on the hot side. Here's my ordinary differential equation on the cold side. I can get rid of the dx's on both sides. And I, I'm left with uh, these two ordinary differential equations, right? So if I want to solve a counterflow heat exchanger problem, I have to solve this math problem, right? There's two coupled differential equations. They're right here. Uh, they're both first order, so I need two boundary conditions. My boundary conditions are that I know uh, at x equals zero, the hot fluid has to be the hot inlet temperature, so that's one. And at x equal L, the cold fluid has to be the cold inlet temperature, so that's two. So this is a well-posed math problem, right? I could solve this any number of ways uh, numerically. Um, this one is simple enough that I can solve it actually analytically. So let's go ahead and, and walk through those steps. The way I do that is actually I subtract this bottom equation from this top equation, and that gives me an equation that is uh, in, in terms of the temperature difference, right? So if I subtract the bottom equation from the top equation, then I get D of TH minus TC over here. And then over here I get uh, TH minus TC. I have a minus UA over L. And then I have uh, 1 over C dot H from the top and minus 1 over C dot C from the bottom. So this entire equation is just these two equations subtracted from each other. And, uh, you know, I can write this equation uh, in terms of a single variable rather than two variables, right? If I, if I define this variable theta, th minus tc, then this is d theta dx. And over here, I've got minus ua over l times theta and 1 over c dot h minus c dot c. So here's my, my, my differential equation written in terms of temperature difference. This one is easy to solve, right? It's separable. So I can uh, bring the theta over here. I'll bring the dx over here. Uh, I can integrate both sides. <clears throat> right, so uh, over here, I'm integrating d theta over theta. Over here, I'm integrating x. You'll notice I've made the uh, approximation, the assumption here when I do this integral that ua uh, is uniformly distributed with respect to x and also that uh, these two heat capacities, these two capacitance rates are constant. Right? So that is a limitation of these heat exchanger solutions. <laughs> All right, so I'm integrating from x equals 0, so over here, to x equals L, so over here. And if I do that, I'm going to have to go from theta at x equals 0, so that's the temperature difference over here at the left side of the heat exchanger, uh, to theta at x equals L, so that's the temperature difference over here. So theta at x equals 0 is Th in minus Tc out, so that's what I put here on the bottom. And then theta at x equals L is Th out minus Tc in. So that's what I put here on the top. So this is my solution right here, right? This is the solution, now not for any heat exchanger, right? This is a solution that is very specific to the heat exchanger I just uh, analyzed, which is a counterflow heat exchanger with some other assumptions that we've talked about, right? So this is, this is the counterflow heat exchanger solution. If I couple this solution with my energy balances, so Q dot is related to um, how much the temperature of the hot fluid changes, it's related to how much the temperature of the cold fluid changes. And then this is what I get by actually diving in and solving two energy balances. Now I've got a complete solution for a counterflow heat exchanger. Right? If you think about it, I take a counterflow heat exchanger, I plumb it up so I know TC in and TH in. I know the flows. I've done some analysis so I know UA. <clears throat> this is three equations in my three unknowns. And my three unknowns are TH out. TC out and Q dot, right? I can solve these three equations together in order to solve my problem. Right? If I uh, want to throw these into E's and I you know, plug in C dot H, C dot C, UA, and my inlet temperatures, I can hit solve and this equation will give me my performance, right? So I'm, I'm technically done in terms of math, uh, at least for a counterflow heat exchanger. Um, all that the uh, effectiveness NTU solutions do is take a solution like this, which is already sufficient, and just do a little bit of algebra in order to put it into a form that's more um, user-friendly, more easy to use, right? So just to be clear, <coughs> at this point here, I'm done with my solution. And all we're going to do in the next lecture is talk about how to put this into a form that makes it really easy to use. And that form is 
typically the effectiveness NTU uh, form, right? So there's two different forms people like. One is the log mean temperature difference. The other is the effectiveness NTU uh, uh, form. They're both algebraically equivalent. Both come from just doing algebra on these three equations, right? We're going to talk about the effectiveness NTU form because I find it to be the most flexible, the most easy to use. But just in your mind, know that you know all we're doing is some algebra to put this into a, a form that is easy to go look up and use when you come to any heat exchanger. And then every heat exchanger solution, right? So this is just one, but there's one for parallel flow. There's a bunch for cross flow, shell and tube. All those different solutions, they all get put into the same form, right? So they're going to be different equations, but those equations will be presented to you in the same form in that they have the same variables, effectiveness and NTU and capacitance ratio, so that it's easy for you to, to use whichever uh, solution uh, represents your problem the best. And that's what we'll talk about uh, in the next uh, lecture.